we we really have lost our human right to decide for ourselves what we want and don't want. And it's alarming. And I don't think, I, I mean, I guess that's um, in line with our education system, right? Like we're not teaching kids to be empowered. And so we raise generations of people who don't push back. Hello, hello, all those beautiful faces. How we doing? How we doing? Stephanie checking in with another episode of Class Disruption. And this week I have on my extra beautiful face because we are on winter break. Well, not officially. I still have one more class to teach tomorrow, but most likely by the time that you are seeing this, I will officially be on winter break. So shout out to all my teachers out there getting that rest, that recovery, spending time with your family, getting your head right as we head into that new year. And speaking of getting things right, if you missed the conversation I had last week with the right leader, aka Vernon Wright, founder of Zero Apology Zone, speaker, entrepreneur, educator, just all around dope dude, I call him the teacher, preacher, the way he puts it down. So you definitely want to get out your pen, your paper for that one. And matter of fact, just keep it out because I have another one dropping the knowledge on us this week. Dr. Christina, she's a veteran educator turned parent consultant. She does a lot of research in the field of education and parenting. She puts out amazing content on her social media. So you definitely got to go follow her there on Instagram, which is actually how we got connected. I have all that information in the description down below. Go follow her, show her some love because she really breaks it down in this video. She brings us on her teacher journey, which started way back when she was in elementary school, first came to the United States from the Dominican Republic, and she brings us all the way through, gives such good parenting tips that also apply to education, breaks down a lot of the political things going on and where she sees education headed. So get ready, and without any further ado, Dr. Christina. I feel like we're already getting into it, so just real quick, you know, let people know who are you, where are you from, what are you all about? Oh my goodness, that's a lot because I'm 40. Um, ah, wait, is it, it was recently, right? Uh, well, it was in March. Oh, it's in March. Okay, I didn't know if we had to like wish you happy birthday or something. Don't wish me happy birthday. I think hey, I have happy birthday, birthday yet, right? <laughs> so, so you have a party. Um, but um, my name's Christina, and um, I'm a. I identify as a Black Dominican woman. Um, I grew up in the Bronx. Um, I came. I. I grew up in the Bronx, but before I came to the Bronx, I was in DR, like living my best life. Um, okay, well, so how old were you when you came to the Bronx? So I came to the Bronx when I was nine. Okay. Yeah, and been here ever since. And um, soon after I became a public school teacher, I went to college, I went to Cornell University, which was by far the craziest experience of my life. I was going to say, like, dang, like, Cornell, okay. Like, I'm over here, like, University of Connecticut, like. <laughs> well, girl, um, yeah. So, Corn Cornell is my pet name. Oh, Portland. okay. Um, I've never been back um, since I graduated. It was the best of times and the worst of times. Very Charles Dickens. Um <laughs> it, it was a lot. It was a okay. lot for someone like me to show up there um, and not really belong. And having come from the Bronx, where I always felt like I was in community, mm. right? So were things messed up? Yes. Did I really know they were messed up? Not so much. Um, but did I have like a group of people that I connected with and loved and cared for me and grew up with and we knew each other yes and that was all erased when i went to the school so that was really hard and i survived it um and not many kids like me survived places like that and and i clearly learned that that it was like oh you can't really just show up here um and i went to school to be a lawyer because growing up what i also did see in my family of people were a bunch of my friends who went to elementary school with me or middle school with me and then got picked up by the police and we never saw again, mm. right? And so they pretty much disappeared and they were kept alive by their parents who, who sort of still talked about them and cared about them. But for the most part, 
we just kept going and we didn't know where these kids were. And I, I got to thinking and got to knowing and investigating and realized that like, oh wait, <laughs> there's a whole bunch of kids that kind of just got picked up um, and racially profiled and sort of just end up in jail and they never get out of that system. And so my little Claire Huxtable Cosby dream suddenly became like full stop, it's too late if you're trying to fix a system once they're in it. Like you sort of have to prevent them from getting in it. Okay, okay. Um, and so I looked into myself, right? I was like, well, what kept me? Cause I was a walking statistic, right? Like I had a single mom, I grew up with a single parent in the poorest congressional district in America. Um, I went to the worst schools. I had the worst teachers. I mean, you name it. I was like either going to end up pregnant as a teenager or in jail myself. Right. And none of those things happened to me. And, and, and so and what I really excelled, I assume. Well, technically, right. Yeah. According to society, I excel. Right, right. Um, I mean, in, in the system as yeah. it is though, you, you excel. Right. And so I was like, well, what made me different from them? Because we were neighbors, we were friends. We had the same, like, dreams we had goals we had fire right. um, i made it and they didn't right and so i got to thinking and it was this so when i got here at nine years old there weren't i mean it was 1989 bilingual programs were sort of always being cut threatened all this stuff was always happening in the 80s and the 90s um I lived in the Bronx, which was new to this whole bilingual thing. So they had like one class per grade back then, different from like Washington Heights, where that's where they all took off. Right. Okay. So I'm in the Bronx, sort of show up in the middle of December, like every good Dominican. Um, <laughs> hey, the flights are cheaper, damn it. People don't get it. Anyway, so I, I showed up at like, like after December break. So it was like January or whatever. Yep. And we show up and we're in my parent, my mom's enrolling me in the school and they have no room for me in the bilingual class. And I'm supposed to be in the second grade at that point. I mean, third grade at that point. So they decide the next best thing to do is to put me in the kindergarten class because I don't speak English. And so you put them in the kindergarten class so they can learn English, but I'm nine. Right. So it's like, <laughs> <laughs> Right. So Miss Pompey, this African-American woman who was my teacher, she put me in the back of the classroom, just like they did with all the bilingual kids in that situation and gave them coloring books and like crayons. And they were like, what the heck do we do? Because we don't know what to do. Yeah. Um, and, and I was there for like two days. And then she gave me a math problem, like a math sheet. Okay. And, and, and everyone else had a math sheet. She gave me a math sheet and she saw me do math. Right. And she right. was like, Oh, you can do math. And of well, course, like, I, I went to school. Yeah. <laughs> I could also read and write. Math is a uh, universal language, you know? But I could also read and write, right? So like, and you only learn how to do those things once. So I was literate, but no one understood In that. Spanish, I, you were literate. I was literate. That's, and I think that's super important because we definitely see a difference in our kids who have yeah. a more solid background than the kids who don't. It's, it's much easier for them to make the transition. Right. Um, so, so two or three days later, she was like, let's see what else you can do. Okay. She pushed the shit out of me. Oops. Can you correct? That's okay. That's okay. Class disruption. <laughs> okay. No Good. attention here. Um, so she pushed me to every single limit that she could possibly push me through to. She got books from all over her school. Um, at you that point, was Miss Johnson? Miss Pompey. Miss Pompey. Okay. Oh, go Miss Pompey. Okay. Yes. Um, and, and she realized that I could do these things. So she gave me this reader. It was a Dick and Jane reader. I don't know if you know Dick and Jane. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Dick and Jane. Yes, I knew. I know this. I mean, if there's anything that's like the least culturally connected, <laughs> it's Dick and Jane, right? But you know what that, those, James? Like, come on. I'm not anything like Dick and Jane. <laughs> Dick and Jane was the reader. Dick and Jane was given to me. Dick and Jane, she was like, take this home. If you can read it. I'm going to have you read it to the principal and then maybe they skip you. So I was like, okay. I went home. I read the book. I read the book again. I read the book a hundred times, showed up the next day, read it to the principal, read it to the assistant principal. And somehow I ended up in the third grade. 
Nice. Um, and that clearly changed my whole life, right? Because now I feel capable, I feel seen, I feel heard, I feel valued, I feel like I'm respected, I feel like I'm a learner, right? And that I can contribute to the world. And, and never did I look back. Um, and so that's the story that came to my mind. That's the thing that I thought that changed me or made me different from my peers. And, and so I was like, well, I gotta go be a teacher. Because if I wanna prevent that, then it's in this classroom. So it was too late in the game for me to change my mind and be an education major. I then did a very terrible thing that I asked for forgiveness every single day, but it was a means to an end at the moment. I went to Teach for America and I got in and I, I appreciate your moment of silence because that, that's how I feel. I applied for Teach for America. You did? Sorry. I did. I was trying. I, I didn't get it, but. but lucky I for you. It. <laughs> just trust me um anyway but I did I got in and I was very clear with them I am not teaching anywhere but in my neighborhood and so I taught three blocks down from where I actually okay, lived nice. and grew up um and and that's what I did for a while I was a teacher for eight years I went from there to found a middle school in the Bronx um not a little bit further away from where I grew up and and then I realized, then I got really impatient, right? And just realized that like the system is broken. Like these people don't get it. They don't know what the heck they're doing. Um, they're telling us to do these things that don't really make sense for the kids in our classroom, like readers workshops and all this crazy stuff that like other people come up with. Um, your thoughts and opinions are- They pay good money for coming up with this. <laughs> they do, and it's trash. Um, but, um, but needless to say, right, like you kind of get involved in so much and you realize what really works for kids. You probably feel the same way. You know what works for kids and you get reprimanded for doing it because you're not in lockstep with every other teacher. That's I've it. I've been in trouble my whole life. <laughs> well, exactly. I got tired of getting in trouble um and thought that I was getting well not really I didn't, never got tired of getting in trouble I thought it was important for me to get in trouble right, right. what was I supposed to do with all these degrees but at some point you want to be your own boss but I realized so so I thought that maybe if I became an admin I could like do better mm -hmm. that's trash so that, <laughs> either. that was a very short-lived experience where I was like oh the higher up I had a professor in college tell me the higher up you go, the less power you have. And I thought she was bananas. Like, I was like, come on, the higher up you go, the more power you have. And she's like, no, your strongest place is in the classroom. Trust me, trust me. And we were, oh, and, and I believed her, but then I was like, but that don't make sense. But then when you got, when I got to the admin space, I was like, oh. Because it's the numbers, right? It's because that's what I, that's what I, you know, it's hard to tell because they, you don't get to see a lot, but that's what I always, that's my sense. My sense is they're just like slave to the data. They're slave to the data. They're, they're so scared, right? At that point, when you're an admin, many folks have spent a lot of time in the system. They're protecting their pensions. They're protecting their, there's so many things mm -hmm. that I don't knock individuals for making decisions like that. Like I understand and respect them. Um, but I didn't go into the system to be there for the 25 status quo, years. Not to be the status right. quo. To get a pension, right? Like I right. didn't do that. I went to do God's work, sacred work, and learn something, right? For oh, myself. I gotta check, I gotta check. I gotta make sure that my tenure went through real quick. <laughs> Just kidding. Exactly. I mean, I was denied tenure for, I think twice. And back when I was a teacher, like it, tenure was like an automatic thing. Like you did it two years and then they just basically signed it off. Um, you were too crazy, and I was denied uh, tenure. You were too crazy for them. Exactly. And that's how they get you, right? Like that's how they try to control the masses to keep principals need to keep their staff on lock because if not, then someone else is coming to watch. And it's just this cycle where if if you allow yourself to get comfortable, which is why I appreciate your disruption and your constant commitment to that, you can really be part of the problem, right? Like so 
easily without having that intention or without wanting to do that. That's what I always say. I always say like, you know, good people, you're a good person, but the problem with good people is they usually take the path of least resistance. And, yes. and, and that's the problem with good people. That's why I don't want to be a good person. Yeah. So I, I can't agree with you more. Like the road to hell was definitely made with good intentions. It was a bunch of really good people having really good ideas and then giving them up um, in the service of someone else's needs, right? Because that's what good people do. They take care of other people, except if you're taking care of the wrong people, <laughs> you're doing bad, right? Like you're doing harm. Um, and so at the end of all of those experiences and 15 years in the education system, I realized um, that I, that I couldn't do that. I couldn't fight that fight from within okay. and that I couldn't do it by myself. Right. That um, as many alliances as I had networked and created that folks weren't interested. Right. Like I'm so happy and proud of the work that you're doing and the alliances that you're building and the networks that you're building. Because back when I was a teacher, we didn't have this at the ready. Right. We had that's why I disagree and really fully dislike places like Teach for America, because they have such a huge network and they don't use it for good. Mm -hmm. um, and that was my issue. Like they didn't come through to like in defense of children because you don't have to come and defend me, just defend children. It, it becomes just about keeping the program running. You yes. know, like, and, th and that's what I see so much is like, it comes in with noble in intentions, like you said, and they want to do all this good and they start making roads. But once they get to a certain place, they're like, okay, well now we need to make sure we keep getting our funding and we need to keep yep. this. And we need yep. to, you know, have certain people in certain places. And now we need to create a, you know, a diversity and equity and all these different things. And yep. <laughs> exactly. So so I ended up leaving and I started a doctoral program um, at the University of Pennsylvania and, okay. and sort of took the time to really study parenting and parent engagement at schools um, or the history of parent engagement. Um, and that was what my dissertation was about, just like how do Dominicans raise their children? Um, mm -hmm. because, I, because it's not the conversations we have, it's not the research that's conducted, and it's the research that's needed so that we can disrupt the way we understand family or parent engagement in our schools today, right? If we're going on data that's trash, that's outdated, that's really centering white middle-class families, then you're really doing a disservice to what um, parent involvement or parent engagement is, right? And so when we have these haphazard failed plans, um, we did this and we did that and they still don't come. It's like, well, cause you're not even really focused on them. You're focused on making them somebody else. And that's never gonna work. Um, and so that's the work that I did in those three years. I started my own consulting business. Um, I do consulting at schools. I do consulting for nonprofits. Um, and I do consulting where I parent, where I coach parents and spend and that's where I want to spend most of my time. So some of the folks on my team do the school work now. Um, well, not now, but um, oh, we have a message. We have we we need to interrupt this for a message. We have a message. We have a message. Your message is. Can you read me your message? What does your message say? What does it say? Because sometimes the camera messes it up. Does it say? Does it? What does it say? What do the words it mean? It says zoo. It says. Oh, you're at the zoo. Welcome, he says, welcome to the zoo. Welcome to the zoo. <laughs> That's his thing. I, I always say that it looks like he writes in Russian. Like, I think that it, it looks kind of like Russian, like how it's like boxy. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they're clear. I just thought it was like flipped. You know how like kept the camera. Oh, no, it doesn't actually say anything. It's just a bunch of letters that he has. I'm down with it. All right. You <laughs> should be good. Got him, got him like a little treat. Is that good parenting? That's amazing. You did just fine. I love it when it's not like, go away, you know? <laughs> well, you know, I'm, I'm taming myself here. I don't want to give bad parenting. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was going to ask you. I was going to ask you, so like, we can beat our kids, not to beat our kids. Like, where do you stand on that? 
I stand on all things that you would not mind having done to you, right? <laughs> okay, how do you okay. how do you want to be treated? No, I probably could have used a, a few beatings when I was a kid. <laughs> I would say that you or kids or including myself, um, I think that one of the things that we really should think about is is really honing in on parents connecting with their children at those deep, like mm -hmm. soul to soul level um, that we are preventing that to happen. Schools are preventing it with all this crazy homework nonsense. Um, the society is preventing it with like the kind of work schedules that our world seems to need, particularly in places like New York where we have to function 24 hours a day. Um, just the expectations that we have of ourselves that cause all this stress that don't allow us to connect. Um, that those are the things that I think are the most valuable because a child that is connected, um, that feels safe and secure is going to take greater risks, is going to bounce back from mistakes, is going to persevere, is going to be resilient. Those, those things only come when they feel that there's someone there that has their back, right? That someone there that's there for me, right? We talk about that in schools a lot, where it's like, what, make sure that at least one adult knows the child, right? That you pride yourself right, in right. The one person that every child can connect to, if not more than one adult. Um, because we know how valuable that is to the impact of their achievement overall. Like, if I go to school and I don't talk to anybody, none of my peers and none of my teachers, then why am I going to school? Right. And, and then it's, I think it's also harder to like map things on that you learn, right? Because like you, learning is so relational. Yeah. You're going to remember like, oh, that's when, you know, Raymond cracked that, that joke or whatever and whatever, whatever. So if you're not, if you don't have those relationships to kind of store the information in, then it's just like, boop. I mean, it's already like that, right? Yeah. It's already like that, right? And, and, and I think that it starts at home, right? Like, I think that we spend a lot of time telling parents that that's not important, that the important things are like getting your homework done mm -hmm. and, and getting your dishes washed and keeping a clean home. And the really important things are creating that fertile ground so that then those connections can happen in class so that the teacher could say something very bizarre and the student is like, hold on, that kind of makes no sense to me. Or more importantly, like that makes sense and I can relate it to so many other things and yeah. sort of keep that in your head. You made, right I was gonna say, you made an interesting distinction between the two, like what we see in school is so often like it needs to be graded, data driven, da 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 da. And like then you were saying in the parenting, it's so much about like doing homework, like doing chores around the house, like keeping things clean. So they're very like you can measure it, right? And the thing that you're talking about is so much less tangible. And I feel like so often in school, we're also saying like that less tangible part is missing. Yeah. And no, you can't measure it, you know, it's not going to fit in your rubric, but it's there, you know? Yeah. And it's, and it's, and it's not gonna, if you don't put it in place, or if you don't invest time in creating it or nurturing it, nothing else is going to move. Mm -hmm. And that's the part that we don't want to accept as a system because we want to measure everything right that's the part that we don't want to accept as parents because we don't want to because we want to measure it like i want to be able to say as a parent that i spent three hours doing homework with him every day and that's what makes me a good parent well if you spent three hours doing homework and fighting with them for three hours every single day i don't know <laughs> what the homework right. was right. about yeah. like was it really time where you're connecting, where you're really supporting one another, where you're learning from each other. It's not, it's like we're fighting for three hours and here yeah. we go. Um, and if your child then really makes a connection with people just on fighting, right? Like the only way I ever get my parents' attention is when they're fighting or arguing with me for my homework, then that is the way they connect. And the, they built these um, very oh, yeah. disruptive, dysfunctional ways of looking for connection. And so they go to places like school where there are other people and how do they try to connect? 
through arguments, through fights, because that's how they understand connection. And so what we want to do is not do that at home. Like we want to spend most of our time really connecting and, and building confidence, right? And, and I have this method that I teach or support parents in understanding, which is this coin method, right? Where it's like confidence, um, observation, information, and navigation. Right. And the idea is that you really build confidence through connection, that you you really connect with your child because confidence comes from within. And so we want to make your child so happy inside that everything that comes out is very confident. And only parents can do that because there's something really real about birthing a child or raising a child, even if you didn't birth them, that really builds that connection that then just fast forwards the confidence. And I think um, it's hard. I think it's harder today, right? Because I can sit on the couch, whereas before, like, okay, maybe some TV program was on the background, or maybe there wasn't TV. So I'm just sitting there. I have, maybe I have a magazine or something. Now I have my phone. And that phone is super sucks you in, you know? So you have to be very intentional. About it. I always try to do it, especially like if I just pick my son up, like when we're in the car, I try to like spend most of the car ride, like, talking to him or like we play I spy or we'll like we do a thing like where we make up stories things yeah. like that and yeah. um so I just really try sometimes he'll go off in his own world and he just likes to sing he'll he'll sit there and make up songs and like look out the window or whatever and then I'll like turn on the radio but like I really try to like be super intentional with that like first hour when I see him like after school or pick him up from his dad's or in the morning yeah and and that's all that it needs right like it's that's all they need it's just us to be really intentional and it's not about 20 this is what i also love about us as parents that we get so intense it's like okay i have to connect so every moment i have to connect no they also need time to be on their own mm -hmm. and they need to be time to explore and they oh, need time to go. from you he has the sign he has a little sign he writes whatever his letters are on and he tells me this says no parents allowed no parents right and that's okay. important to respect that and that's tricky but it's important because they need a balance mm -hmm. but they need to know that there's a moment that it's predictable that every day my mom is going to ask me how I'm doing, or she's gonna tell me about her day. And the expectation is that I listen and then tell her about my day, that we're gonna sing silly songs, that we're gonna play I Spy, or would you rather, would you rather is a lethal Ooh, game? Because they tell you very <laughs> random things. And I'm like, I don't, no, I don't rather I, anything. <laughs> we play a game where you have to like, you know, who can lift the most stuff, right? And yeah. so we'll just start like stacking stuff. And, you know, all of a sudden he's got like dinosaurs and planets and like all this crazy stuff. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. I can't hold all that, you know? <laughs> that in and of itself, if it takes one hour or 20 minutes or even just 10 on a very crazy day, it doesn't matter. It's that I know as a child that there's this person mm. who cares and wants to connect with me and that that's going to build that confidence, right? Um, I think another thing is this piece of observation. We don't take time as parents to really watch our children. Mm. Something you said earlier, it's like we jump um, to prevent something. We jump to say, be careful. We jump to say, stop. We jump to say no. But there's never this like pause where we're just watching their brilliance, right? They're magnificent humans who have real clear ideas that are oftentimes different than our messed up robotic ways of thinking about the world because we're we're tainted we're jaded we're we already have like all of our you know connections have been honed down to the shortcut so we can be effective you know right because we're trying to survive this world yeah. and they're just trying to create a world right and that's a whole different way of seeing the have world you seen, i read some research it was a while ago I was reading some book about like how to change your mind and they were talking about different research and they were talking about research with psilocybin and like some doctor was saying like that a kid's brain is a lot like your a brain that is like on psilocybin because I guess it, it like helps make more connections or something like that and so you think you think a lot less um like what do you call it like how things are like you're not you're not tied to like how reality actually is at all yeah and and the truth is that our reality is jaded by our experiences right and that they we want to believe that 
most parents believe that they're doing the work that it takes to make their child's life better of than course. theirs. Yeah. And if we really are doing that, then why are we holding them prisoner to our functioning world? They're in a whole other world because mm. we've made it different. And we actually don't know how to navigate that world because right. we've never been there. Right. So it's got to be a balance too, right? Like, you know, you, like you said, observe them and this and that, but sometimes you got to be like, yo, you got to sit down at the dinner. Like that's how I, it, I'm big on like the dinner table, like sit down, eat your dinner. Like you want to get up from the dinner table? Like, cool. Like that's it. No dinner, you know? And that's fine. And I think that that works in your family. And I think that that's important to say, right? I think the other part that we don't do as a family is that we don't tell our kids. We just, we just like, demand of them right and they can think and they can reason like they can say okay I can do all these other things right if you just communicate with me that like but at this time you expect me to sit at this table okay. right yeah yeah sometimes we're just like sit at the table sit at the table and there's no like understanding of why or what's the commitment behind it or or reality check of like dude, this is the only thing I ever ask you to really do. So come on, right? Like, cause they're there for us too. They're willing to comply. They just need to understand that that's, that's the expectation. It, as right. opposed to like, just randomly like sit. Cause I said, cause it's dinner. Right, so, right, right. Okay. So I think it's more about just observing how they function, understanding how they work and then being able to talk to them in the right way. Cause there's also different ways to talk to them. I have two girls. I can't talk to both of them the same way. It's like, night and day and I'm like but who is your mom like I am the same human but they are they receive information very differently from me um and they're also different developmental stages right so I have a 13 year old who who everything is a problem and then I have a seven year old who's like if you don't hold me down to listen I'm probably not going to listen to you so we have those extremes here um, and so the conversations are very different, but the point is that you have the conversation and that I have observed them and watched them enough to know this is how I have to deliver the stuff to the 13 year old. So she actually does it and only fights a little bit. And this is how I have to talk to the seven year old. So she actually feels like she, so I feel like I, I was hurt because who knows what she really listens to. <laughs> um, but I think that's, that's the part that we know them well enough that we don't just say that we say that a lot well I'm the parent I know them and I'm like but do you really mm. like how do they eat what do they pick on first how fast do they chew their food how slow like there's so many things that go into knowing your child and it's so important to just take the time slow yourself down and do the work of watching mm. just do the work of watching because you're going to learn everything about what makes them tick Right. And then you take all that information, which is the I and that coin method. You take all that information and you basically make sense of it and present your child to things that empower them or help them grow. Because now, you know, or you present them to the world in a way that's a powerful from a powerful standpoint. Right. So right. a lot of time parents come into school and they're like, teacher, tell me what's going on. And I'm like, no, the teacher can say whatever she wants to tell you because she's the teacher. And then you have to have something you say back. Like, that's interesting because my child is actually this person. Right. And balance the perspective for the teacher because she only sees them in this space in this way. And right. if that is not the way that they thrive, it is that not their space of power, then what you end up seeing as the teacher is simply just a shell of the kid. So if the parent is not equipped to fill that void, then everyone's just walking. There's a bunch of people that are in communion with this child that doesn't know them. I, the I, 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 and the teacher doesn't. That's my experience a lot as, as a teacher. And you know, I don't want to judge anybody or, you know, say that they're wrong for that or whatever but I do I feel like a lot of times it's just like I just like say things to a parent and then just like okay and they and they move on and and I'm I, I want more like I want them to push back I want them to like you know 
take advantage of of that space and i see it too like in other ways too like even just like in workplace you know dynamics you'll see people just like like kind of i call it like you're seeding your power not like power is in this way where you're like trying to like go up the ladder and be something but it's like and to me i this is a really interesting point i think also and we don't necessarily have to talk about it now i'd love to have you for like i want to put together a nice white parents um like round table discussion you have you listened to that podcast no i have not so you got to listen to the podcast because this is a lot where it comes in where it's about it's a five episode thing and they talk a lot about like equity and power and and you know like the these white parents they come in and they you know they have all this this power and this thing and and yet there's parents who had a whole committee and like they were there but it's almost like they just seeded the power like in the moment it's, I mean, I'm just thinking back on it and, and that's how I like perceived it. I definitely want to listen to it again. I'd love to see like how you interpret that. Yeah. We'll know exactly what situation I'm talking about. Okay. Um, but uh, I just wanted to, to make that observation there, but you were talking, so that's the I, right? Yeah. And then what's the N? And the N is navigation. So how do you take all the information, all your observations, all your, all the, the okay, key, yeah. all this confidence, and how do you navigate the world in which you exist as a parent or they exist as a student, right? And that's where your point comes in right now around, you know, what happens at parent-teacher conferences? Well, I can tell you culturally from a black or brown family, what's really happening is that as, as a cultural right, like as our stance, we respect the teacher so much. Like we're not, <laughs> black and brown folks are not like, um, whatever other folks are where it's like well every i have my own opinion and everyone has their own opinion no like in brown kind of like I, a doctor like you go to the doctor they tell you what it is and you and you like okay i think i think black and brown people value teachers at a higher rate at a higher level than even doctors right okay. there's this real reverence to teachers um because that's not something that's just like it is a commodity it's not something that everyone just had right from the times of slavery to to the times in like immigrant poverty impoverished communities right like we don't come from this like there's a bunch of teachers and education is a right we're still in the dominican republic still fighting for like a basic funding system for public schools right so when we see teachers there's like so much respect we value what they're saying we value what they believe and we don't overstep like we think that our job as parents is to make sure they're ready to learn they arrive ready to learn and that means you're fed you're clean you're awake you're on time those kinds of things we can control the teacher i'm not going to tell her she's not doing her job i don't even know how to do that like that doesn't even make sense culturally but what we understand about america is that it's a different cultural system right like they you need to tell me, you need to push right. back because I otherwise, writing. you know, I always, yeah. one thing I definitely always try to do is I'll be like, like, what do you want to do? Like what, are, or what are you interested in? So I definitely try to, to grab at it and, and invite people in yeah. and, and stuff. So I don't know if you have, like, do you have any like specific tips, like whether it's for parent teacher conference or just parent involvement, like how can schools like get people to to PTA meetings. I mean like even I mean I mean I know at my school we struggle with it like but all the people who run the PTA are like it's like Miss Lopez and and like women of color or with Hispanic backgrounds. So I mean yeah. I don't know if there's like how can we get parents more involved. I I think another another piece to that is well one thing is in those parent teacher conferences what I try to help teach parents do is sort of understand that like we're in a different cultural space and we need to we need to actually tell them before they even start we need to tell them this is who my kid is or listen to them and then say that's interesting let me tell you something else about my kid okay, let me so tell you who my kid them is to do that or we should tell them to so do that. i i tell them some schools do that too they'll tell their their parent coordinators will train their their parents on like these are some things you can ask um, it's all very tricky though, because all these people get paid by the same people. So you're not, parent coordinators aren't generally trying to make teachers work more, right? Because it's like, oh, then it's bad. <laughs> um, so depending on your school, it may not work from that stance, but I definitely tell parents, you always ask the teacher, 
How do you know? Like why and how do you know? Mm. Don't, you could give me all the data in the world. That's fantastic. Why, why do you know that? Or why do you think that? And how do you know that? Where's the data? Where's all the stuff you collected to come up with that grand idea? And I don't care what the idea is. It could be your child is great or your child is failing. Either way, you want to know how they came to that conclusion, number one. And two, you also want to know what she's doing about it or what the teacher's doing about it. Like, why are you taking that? That's not your job. Like, okay, so tell me your plan for how to make that better. Or tell me your plan, which is always very tricky. Tell me your plan for that kid that's so, that's high achieving. So tell me what's your plan to make her better. Mm. So she's great. So how do you, how are you going to make her better? Because that sounds crazy. Um, so I, I give them those tools, but I think in the school's perspective, I don't care what your last name is. I don't care who's running the system or the programs, or I don't care if they reflect the community. If you are black or brown in a black or brown community or much predominantly black or brown community, we don't do things for ourselves. We do things for the community, right? So if these events are not attached to a community of people that need me to do something, then it doesn't work. That is why potlucks work so well. Okay, so I was just gonna like say something right? like that, okay. Yeah, potlucks work all the time because the potluck is like, I have to bring the rice. And if without my rice, someone's not gonna eat rice. So I show up to the potluck because I have to bring the rice. Okay. Right? And everything doesn't have to be a potluck, but everything has to be just in the service of others. Same night that you have the art show or the same night you have, you know, um, the debate going on or something it could be like a pre-event to that. It could be okay. to that. It could also be like, you know, a lot of classes, a lot of schools would offer like parents um, ESL classes. Okay. Which sounds like a great service, right? Like you're trying to support parents and help them learn English because that's what the community said they wanted. Um, to send up a survey, right? And see what people want. Like do ESL, that's important. parenting kind of tip classes, what, you know, what have you, okay. Right. Again like though, if I'm learning English for myself, I will go maybe once and then someone will have something in my house that I need to take care of. And then I'll just take care of them. And then after two weeks, I'll be like, Oh, I'm so far behind. I don't feel like I feel so embarrassed to go back. And then I don't go back. Right. And these things happen all the time. And so the other part is we need you to learn English because we need it for this. Like it needs to be attached to a means. Like there needs to be an end to it. Like, our school needs to make sure that our parent community can advocate for themselves at this event. And so we're going to do English classes. We're going to do training classes because we all need to go here and do this. And everyone has to be part of that. Okay. Right. But what we don't understand, we don't want to accept as a school system is that we're not doing the advocacy work. We're not doing the community work. So we can't actually encourage anyone to come and learn for themselves or to come and learn for in the service of something because we don't ever have the something. Like we don't ever think of like the bigger project because historically we've just never wanted parents in schools in the first place. Like our system, uh, you laugh, it's fun. It's so I'm funny. because it's true. It's like a whole history lesson, right? Like I'm, in 1819, the Native Americans, people went to the Native American tribal homes and were like, hey, can we get your kids and we're gonna yeah, send them to, boarding, them to schools. boarding schools, yeah. Because you're not fit to teach them. Right, and they like right? would them to white men. In 1915, yeah. we did the same things with the Mexicans. We'd send teachers to their house and said, you know what? We're gonna send a teacher to your house so you, they can teach you how to be a better parent. Well, you, yeah, you know, I was, do you know Carrie McDonald? Have you heard of her? No. She's like, she's, the, she, I believe her book is called Unschooled. I haven't read the book. Oh, but I, yes. Yeah, I read a lot of her stuff. And um, she talks about like how the, to have compulsive education, you know, it kind of brings about a lot of these different kind of like authoritarian like things. Cause like I, when I made my first class disruption video, I, it, I was kind of like, um, you know, the whole Dewey thing, like it's a cornerstone of democracy. But I feel like in the last like year or so, I've kind of like backed off that position just because like, I think I understand 
what it means. So what I want hasn't changed. I guess just the way I articulate it is more clear to what I am trying to say. And I, I fully understand the implications of like maybe the other way of articulating it now. Yeah, good for you. Look at yeah. you. Um, yeah, so I mean, historically, we've just done that where we're like, or we'll come up with these policies that sound really inclusive, right? Like, um, No Child Left Behind had some like, no, we have to include everyone, especially those that have different languages. Um, but we're not going to say how. So the how, like the, all so that data too was like, who, who sees that data? How do we use that data? How are we actually, because I think, I think it's a miscon, like, I don't believe that the tests are racist, like in and of themselves, right? Like, okay, we can maybe go back and forth about some questions and like maybe making questions more culturally responsive, but I think it's more about how we use the data and how we know kids are not passing how they're not proficient and then we're just like okay move on to the next grade and we're gonna test you again next year like after uh, that that to me is like if you want to call anything I, I I don't even think it's racialized because I think it affects I, I think it affects everybody I think it's more socioeconomic that that comes to the disparity and it happens to affect you know ki kids of color a little bit more but that that to me is the problem with standardized testing that it's that what are we doing with the data? Yeah, like we have the data, but it's not like being used to inform anything. It's just some test that the state has. They have some data on me. They know I'm failing and then they just pass me on to the next grade. And and why? Right. Like, I'm look, I if we're not if the information is not going to be of service to the achievement of the child, then we don't need the information. Right? Saying, then the information becomes becomes punitive information that we just like have at the back pocket and we pull out yeah. whenever necessary, right. right? We have to also understand that um, education is, is a, is a for-profit business. That's what I'm saying. Know. Pearson wants to make some bucks, you know? We go crazy about charter schools and how much their, their executive directors make. And I mean, they make some millions, some 600,000, right? Like they make a whole lot of money to run a whole lot less schools. But the catch is that the system as a whole, even our public school system, which is the largest in the country, is inherently for profit. Right, right. It guzzles up all the money in the council. It, it guzzles up all our money and it's used, most of the money goes out. So this is what I was thinking the other day, right? Like, okay, so there's some like elite schools that are like fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year, or whatever. But we pay what twenty eight thousand dollars a kid? Yo, you can go to a nice private school for thirty for thirty thousand dollars a year, you know? Like, what are we doing with that well, money? Well, what well, we're giving it to Pearson. Cause what are we doing? Cause what are they not doing at those private schools? They're not testing you. Oh yeah, yeah. That like money, that money doesn't leave school. their school. That yeah. money doesn't leave their school. That money stays right there. They pay their teachers. They pay facilities. They pay for coaches for everything. They pay for the sustainability of students that attend. Right? Like, oh, you you want to come here? Come here. Oh, it's not working for you. Let's get you the supports that you need. They pay for that. Right. And so it's not, not going, going anywhere. Testing. I, I think at the lower levels, they do do like a lot of those more like, like reading tests and math tests and like figure out kids levels. You don't think so at all? They figure out your level, but they don't like, um, it's not like big, like the state test, but I know like I, I worked at a tutoring place. So it's a little different from a private school, but we use like a lot of like the what what kind of test was it? it was like the woodson something like this whole we had a whole thing of tests that we would use to like level the kids but it was like super informative and the whole thing was like very positive because then you can show the kids six weeks later like when you came in progress this and now look at what you can do right but those are individualized assessments yeah. and not necessarily wide tests to be intended to be punitive right so right they test in the sense of like how do we how do we help ourselves um help the kids or know the kids well enough um but they're not punitive this is more right. like we're not trying to know anybody we're not even trying to figure right. out who's taking the test we're simply just trying to and the and the thing that's really important to understand is that the 
most people that know get out of the test, right? Most people opt out. Most parents who know what's right opt out of these tests. And the other parent then, and the scale changes all the time. And no one's like, why am I a four and not a four this time, right? Because if too many people get fours on a test, that scale's changing next year. And if you did exactly right, the same waited, way, you know, you're going to be a three, right? So it's, it's those kinds of things that are happening that we're not paying attention to. And most importantly, we don't, we don't hold them accountable. Like no one is saying at the federal level, like, no, this is, we just want to know how kids are doing and we want to be ethical and responsible around it because yes, we should know as a, as a country, a well-developed country, we should know how our kids are doing. And if we're going to say tests are the way to go, then fantastic, but let's keep it ethical because right now we can't right. say right. what kids are doing because these tests are unethical. So don't even make sense. I definitely think they're racist. I definitely think they're biased. I definitely have a very strong stance on that. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, I think that what we can all agree on across race, class, gender, social, economic status, I think it's really just they're unethical because the things they're out to get, the information they're out to get, they're not getting. Right. And so why exactly. do we keep doing it? That's and that's yeah. my main thing. Yeah. And so um I guess well you said you have two kids. I don't if you wanna dive um bold, like are they, you know, New York City public schools, you homeschool, like like what Yeah, so they go to one of those schools that you were describing. <laughs> What oh oh what uh one of those fifty thousand dollars schools. Oh okay. <laughs> um I mean I don't want to say where they're going. Just That's fine, you don't have to okay. okay. So I was here in the Bronx, like, one of the hills right now. I was just trying to get it like right now in the you know, what's their situation? Are they home? Are they in school? Like if you wanna share us like what your whole perspective yeah. is on like what's happening right right now. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, private schools get the luxury of not having to run under the city standards. Some of them are choosing to. So some city schools, in New some private schools, like independent schools, what they call themselves in New York City, are running like the DOE. But um, others, many of them are not. Right. So that's what happens when you have economic power you can tell people like the head of the school, like, don't you dare close, right? And so there's no way that my kids' schools close. Um, the younger kids are all going to school every single day. Um, you have an option to go remote fully if you wanted to, uh, but the little ones, the elementary school is, is full on works functions. There's no after school program, but other than that, it's working. Okay. Um, the middle school and the high school kids are on this like rotation, very similar to the DOE, right? Okay. They um, go two days a week, one week, and then three days a week, the next week, and then two, day, two and three and two and three. Um, there's very serious strict standards around like how they close and what they close about. So if some, they do like contract tra contact tra tracing and all that stuff, they do um, do tests, but they're not doing the COVID tests, the nasal ones, they do the spit ones. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. So those are, those are some of the things that I see in their school that I'm just dumbfounded that are not happening in the DOE schools. Right. right. So now that they closed and then reopened for some of the schools, they're like forcing kids to be tested. And that's really tricky. That's like, we're losing, we're losing so much during this COVID thing. Um, and I think we're, we're feared into releasing so much um, that it's really disturbing. Like we, we really have lost our human right to decide for ourselves what we want and don't want. And it's alarming. And I don't think, I, I mean, I guess that's um, in line with our education system, right? Like we're not teaching kids to be empowered. And so we raise generations of people who don't push back and are easily feared into things. And fear is a, it's a crazy tool that is used by, you're a history buff, but it's used by tyrants and um, dictators. I mean, this is what, this is the tool to use to do awful things 
to massive groups of people, right? Um, it's, it's what we've done. And so this is where we are. And I feel like none of us are saying enough about or pushing back on some of the things. And there are parents that are trying, but they're also capable of pulling their kids out. So if my kids were in a different situation and I didn't like what was going to happen, I have the option to pull my kid out and keep them home, right? One, because I'm an educator. Two, because I just have the means to do it, right? I can. Um, and most people cannot. And those are the people that I worry the most about. And I think about what are we doing, right? Which is why I applaud you for the work that you do um, going to City Hall and trying to get our schools open. Because the other part about this thing is that I know that my kids' school is open to the little ones five days a week because of childcare. My daughter, my middle schooler is really the one that needs to be there because developmentally, that is the person that needs to be in school, socializing and interacting, right? I hurt for you as a, as a high school teacher because your students are in, are in the same place as my middle schooler, right? It's that six to 12 band of kids that are nowhere um, and are the ones that need it the most. And so everyone wants to talk now about mental health. We've had a mental health crisis way before this was happening with our children. Um, and this has just exasperated it, right? And so I can't imagine what kind of suicide ideation rates are like in real time, not the so stuff that's reported. The, I was gonna say, did you just see this, the CDC statistic? It's something like a 30 something percent increase in hospital visits for mental health right and that means that kids are attempting suicide or self-harming or like really bad anorexia like you're yep. going to the hospital if it's bad if it's life-threatening and who goes to the hospital right because right. what we know about that is that it's not everyone that goes to the, everyone that's in that situation is not going to the hospital exactly that's what the numbers are showing and then, and then there's plenty of kids who are not that you know that not that extreme but are really suffering and i see it every day you know like even my good kids like they'll like be out a week or two weeks and then they'll be like i right, miss i'm back like you know i got my head right or whatever wow. so it's like and it's you know they'll be like miss like when are the buildings gonna open or like i had a couple kids who were like really really you know upset when the buildings closed yeah and and just like they struggle and they knew that the building was what they needed yep so it's just and it's our safest bet right like if we want to think about the science and i'm i'm a, i always say i'm not a doctor now i'm like i am a doctor I'm just you are a doctor. A doctor. <laughs> um i i if i understand the science correctly if we're all wearing masks which I also whatever have a problem with, but if we're all wearing masks and we're being intentional about being safe, I don't really understand um, why we're not in school because those are very controlled, sanitized spaces um, that go in line with the, the science and all the things that are being pushed on. And they're doing here. it in Europe. It's not like we have to guess. They yeah. are doing it in Europe. They're wearing oh. their jackets, they're putting on their hats, you know, and, and that's the other thing too. I just think, like you said, we're getting, like, we're soft, you know, like people work outside all day. Like, I'm sorry, teacher, zip up your jacket, put on your scarf and, and teach the kids. Like I, I give the teachers, oh, yeah. But it's not just the teachers, right? Like it's the union too. Like well, there's, commit, there's inherent commitment to keep your stances, right? Like, and I'm just like, and who is working for kids here? Like, that's, the, I mean, that's the why union I love is, I like, The union cares? openly doesn't work for the kids. The union yeah. for the teachers, yeah. you know? No, and, I and get it, I get it. But supposedly the argument is that we're working for the teachers who service kids. And, and kids. yeah. But well, well, we're never really well, landing at the kids part. We always start with the adults. Yeah, it's an organization that, that's one of those organizations that just exists to keep itself existing. Existing, you know? right. And if there's no problem, then they can no longer exist. Um, so yeah, no, totally agree. I mean, to be fair, and I always have to say this disclaimer, it's like, but the unions, um, also allowed spaces for black and brown people to enter the workforces in different ways and sort of made that a requirement. At the exchange, we lost the power to 
be educators in the ways we wanted to be educators. And so there's there's always been that trade-off where you you unfor in an unjust society, you you any trade-off is gonna be unfair still, right? Because the system itself is still That's a letter. Oh, you got another letter. All right, last letter, because after this we're gonna wrap it up. What's this one say? What does this say? What does it say? Anything good? Oh, well, she has to find. Oh, you, she. <laughs> all right. We'll we'll decode it. I think it says it's almost bedtime, and we're gonna read Pokemon. The, how do you know that? <laughs> That's what moms do. They just know. They know everything. Can't. Everything. Well, so what I was going to ask you to wrap it up is what's any words of advice, inspiration, motivation that you have for the people? For the people, for the people. I think um, I really, I really hope it is my hope. It is my purpose. It is my passion to ensure that parents understand that they actually have full control of the education system. Um, that they are actually the chancellor and the mayor's bosses um, and that they're not waiting for someone to give them an answer and that that's going to take time. I get it, but that's my real lofty goal and my real lofty message. Like, honestly, during this time, I really hoped that folks were like, you know what, if my kid is going to be home, then I might as well um, homeschool. And mm -hmm. just like defund the system, like just Ooh. to be like, oh, well, we don't need, we don't need schools because no one's here, right? Um, I guess I'll have to wait for the next pandemic for that. But, um, <laughs> but needless no, to right. say, right, right now, now, still the time is ripe. I'm still working on it. I mean, I still encourage people all day, every day to, I mean, that's my class disruption, right? Like I spend all my time talking to parents and saying, you know what, but if it's, this is not really necessary for his success. This is just a requirement because they need it. Why don't you, if he's home already, I can help you teach him there the you right go. things. There you go. Uh, just homeschool and you can write the letter right now. So, I mean, I've been successful twice, but um, there's still more work to do, but kids are home and we get to listen. And I hope parents are hearing how painful some of these experiences are for their children. I've seen kids been told like, you're not getting a star or something. This is charter school. You're not getting a star or something because you're not sitting like this. And I'm, or kids are being policed about their bathroom break. Like, I'm just like, what is this? Like, why are you letting this happen? Right. And parents are hearing this and allowing this to happen and allowing their kids to be shamed and embarrassed for like the point system or the bathroom going or not going. And my thing is like, the, it's enough. Like we've made it, it's, it's enough. And, and we need to just stand up for our kids. Um, and I know that we're hurting because we're also a generation of children that were raised in that system. So we don't even know, we don't even know what bad is. Um, because we had worse and that's terrible but I want people to still be connected to their guts I want parents to understand like it doesn't sound right like we're ending right where we started where you were like should I spank my kid and I'm like if you don't want this done to you then don't let anyone do it to your kid and know that in the system you actually are the most powerful and you can do it by yourself Mm. or you could do it with a group of people is always more helpful but even if you're the only parent in that class that stands up against it other people might actually stand up against it and you could change something but at the very least for right now your child's not feeling that pain and they deserve that they deserve to be happy and content mm. um, in these experiences yes they do and I'm very happy and I don't, not content, not at all. I'm feeling class disruption all day uh, in that fire out here. Definitely have me motivated, thinking a lot about things, you know, I'm doing. And I know that people are going to get a lot of value from this conversation. I'm going to make sure that they're checking you out on Instagram where you're posting all that great content. Are you on Twitter or any other platforms that you like? I'm not. Nah, she said, nah, good. Don't go. Twitter's like, man. <laughs> I'm like, then I'll get all caught up in the Trump stuff. And all that. Maybe now, maybe next year. <laughs> all right, all right. So definitely check out Instagram, and we're gonna talk soon about that that roundtable. So you gotta listen yes. to that podcast. 
Yes, it's the white. Nice white parents is what nice, they're, nice yeah, it's the parents. reference that they're using to kind of um, like undermine the open schools right now. Okay, I'm gonna listen. I'm gonna look that up. I'm gonna listen to that episode, and then we'll chat again. You're so much fun. I love it. I know this is fun. <laughs> hey, we'll do it again. Yeah. I right, well, have a good night, and uh, we'll check oh, good night. Well, I feel like a better parent and teacher already just from having that conversation. She got me thinking about so many different things professionally and personally as a parent and where those two different things overlap and intersect and how they relate to each other. So I'm definitely looking forward to staying in touch with Christina and you should to make sure you are following her on social media. I have all those links in the description down below. She puts out amazing content and it just things that get you to think twice about how you normally do things, how you approach things, why you say things. And, and it pushes me as a parent and as a teacher. So go check that out and make sure you enjoy this break, spending a lot of time with that family. Like we talked about really creating those bonds, creating those relationships, letting your kids know you see them. And of course, make sure you having some fun with it. You know what I'm going to leave you with. Stay foolish, y'all.